Today on Under the Big Tree, looking at the Buchla Music Easel, module by module. Some synthesizers become legends for a reason. The Mini Moog, the EMS Synthi VCS3, and the ARP 2600 are greatly coveted and still in use some 40 years or so after their invention, due to the combination of incredible sound and unique features. These are instruments that are incredibly rich, with depths of sound that emerge through much exploration and experimentation. The other synth that falls into that same category for me is the legendary Buchla Music Easel. First released in 1973, the easel is a synthesizer designed from the ground up as a device for improvisational live performance. It seems on the outside to have a relatively sparse feature set. Two oscillators, one envelope generator, a five-step sequencer, a pulse generator, a random source, and a keyboard made of capacitive touch plates. But the whole is so much more than the sum of the parts. Don Buchla's eclectic design is so well thought out that its true brilliance emerges as your experience with the instrument unfolds. I can safely say that the easel is my favorite synthesizer, one that allows me to express myself on the fly while creating a rich tableau of sounds to shape, create, and explore. Like the Mini Moog, the Buchla Easel is currently in production again, meaning you can enjoy a reliable instrument without having to find a unit that could be decades old with unknown maintenance issues. It is far from inexpensive. I paid $5,000 for mine and only did so after a great deal of thought and research, but I made the leap and have never regretted that investment for a moment. But the investment in money is only worth it if you are willing to make the investment in time to learn it deeply. And I've very much enjoyed making that latter investment, exploring and discovering new things about it every time I sit down with it. I thought I would share some of these findings with you here. Todd Barton has done an incredible job making loads of Buchla Easel videos you can find on YouTube but I thought it might be nice to supplement his work by going systematically through the easel, module by module. Bear in mind that the whole is very much more than the sum of the parts, but let's start by taking a look at what those parts are. The easel is a performance-oriented instrument and is permanently encased within a portable case. It has built-in line-outs and a headphone-out and is powered by an external power supply. It fits easily within an overhead airport compartment and sets up in a flash, making it ideal for travel and gigging. The easel is a semi-modular instrument. It uses banana jacks, and using them is crucial to understanding the power of the instrument. But, like the ARP 2600, it also has hardwired paths to allow you to make default sounds without patching. That's a great way to get started, but the power is in the patch cords. The use of banana jacks means that you can actually gang signals together, routing an output to multiple inputs just by stacking the banana plugs. As an example of the incredibly well thought out design of the easel, the primary control voltage inputs and outputs are arranged in such a way that you can do much of the routing you might want by using these fixed length shorting bars instead of cabling. It makes for a slightly neater presentation and is a bit easier to follow the signal flow visually. In addition, they use color-coded jacks. All black jacks represent inputs, while different colors represent different outputs. Orange represents the envelope generator, yellow is the pulse output, blue is the sequencer output, and so forth. The easel is actually two separate modules stacked together in the case. The stored program sound source, or 208, is the actual synthesizer. It includes the sound generation and processing, as well as the sequencer, envelope, and pulse generation system. The lower half is the touch-activated voltage source, or 218E. This consists of the capacitive keyboard, buttons and switches to alter the voltages of the keyboard, and an arpeggiator. 
This modularity actually allows for an alternative product, the Music Easel K, which substitutes a different tactile input system than the 218E. Let's start with the synthesizer system. The design paradigm moves from left to right, with processing leading to sound generation and modulation, with the rightmost portion being the output section. The whole device is laid out in a grid of functions, which helps with visual clarity. Rather than using knobs, the majority of controls are faders and switches. The whole row of faders take up the center portion of the easel, and the fader tips are the same color as their corresponding output voltage jacks. This helps the understanding of the signal flow immeasurably. We're going to look at each module from right to left. The output section has a master volume knob that controls the quarter inch output jacks on the side of the box. There are also a pair of signal outputs on the top of the box that use the Buchla tiny jack cables, which are close in size to standard eighth inch jacks, but are not quite the same. There is a separate level control for headphones next to the headphone jack. Above that is the level control for the built-in spring reverb. The Buchla reverb is very distinctive and gives an even more 70s vibe to the proceedings. You can also plug the easel into a reverb pedal or other external processing unit for a different type of reverb sound. Above the reverb section are master level controls for the two oscillators in the easel, which we'll get to in a minute. Channel A is the main, or complex oscillator, and channel B is the secondary, or modulation oscillator. As we will see, there are also other signals that can be routed to channel B, depending upon the gate 2 source switch. Next to the channel B control is the modulation VC out, which is a control voltage version of the modulation oscillator's audio signal. Let's take a look at the mixer, which is a simple two-channel mixer, but it perfectly illustrates the approach behind the rest of the instrument as well. The two faders marked level 1 and level 2 are the manual volume faders for the complex oscillator and whatever is being routed towards channel B, generally the modulation oscillator. We can use those faders to change the level by hand. But to the left of each fader is another fader with a black control voltage jack below it and an arrow pointing up to the fader. That fader represents CV control of the same parameter as the manual fader directly to its left. As I mentioned before, a black banana jack represents a control voltage input, and so you can route any control voltage output into that jack, and it will control the corresponding parameter. So let's see how this works with level 2. Let's lower it and connect the purple pressure output to the level 2 control voltage input. This fader controls how much the input voltage controls the level. The low pass gates. Directly above the mixer is some signal routing for the two oscillator paths. There are two gates that the signals pass through on their way to the outputs. The complex oscillator is permanently routed through gate 1. Gate 2 offers three routing possibilities. You can route the output of gate 1 into gate 2 as well. You can route the output of the modulation oscillator there, which is the most common configuration. Or you can route the output of the external preamp through gate 2 instead. What happens as the signal passes through those gates? There are switches below the gate 2 routing that allow you to select the mode of each of the two gates. Each gate can act as a low pass filter, a voltage controlled amplifier, or as a combination of the two. 
This combination mode is none other than the famous Buchla Low Pass Gate. The gate and filter are Vactrol based, which is a component that varies voltage based on reading the value of a small light. The decay of the light, as it turns off, has a very distinctive curve that tends to make percussive sounds sound more acoustic and natural than a typical synthesizer envelope. Here's how the routing works. When voltage controlled amp mode is engaged, the level controls of the mixer work exactly as you would expect, to raise and lower the volume of the signal. In low pass filter mode, the amplifier is replaced with a 12 dB low pass filter with fixed resonance. The level controls affect the filter cutoff frequency in that mode. But when you set the mode to combination, you now have a low pass filter and a voltage controlled amplifier being controlled by the same signal. This is the famous Buchla low pass gate. When you are passing a continuous sound through it, it has a pleasing character that is a bit different than the low pass filter. But when you use it in conjunction with the envelope generator to make short percussive sounds, thanks to the Vactrals, you get the natural, acoustic sounding Buchla Bongo type sound. Now let's take a look at the preamp. The preamp allows you to interface the external world with your Buchla easel. It has a tiny jack's input with three different gain levels, which allows you to use it with a microphone or line level input. The signal is useful in two different ways. First, you can route it through gate 2, which means you process it through the VCA, filter, or low pass gate. So you hear the audio pass through the easel that way, but there is also an envelope detector that converts the audio signal to a corresponding control voltage. Like all other control voltages on the easel, this signal outputs to a banana jack and can be routed to any CV input. Now, depending entirely on an ecological precession to provide the critically needed material, tools, and monies to carry on the work, my friends and family, my wife's family and friends would say, I'm being stubbornly treacherous to my wife and daughter. Not as The complex oscillator is the primary sound generation source for the easel. This is the sound source with the most interesting parameters and the most complex types of controls, hence the name complex oscillator. The complex oscillator has two primary parameters, pitch and timbre. Pitch has a slider that is helpfully labeled in hertz. The manual slider lets you configure the pitch to anywhere between 55 and 1760 hertz but the actual range of the oscillator is far higher. Add the keyboard or some other control voltage to modify the pitch, and you can go as low or high as you possibly want to. For more precise tuning, there is a fine-tuned knob with a range of about a major sixth. Above the sliders is a waveform switch and timbre knob. The switch allows you to select between triangle, pulse, and sawtooth waves. But when the timbre knob is all the way down, all you hear is a sine wave. As you turn the timbre knob clockwise, the waveform mixes between that sine to whatever waveform shape you have selected. The waveform selection is relatively static in that there is no direct control voltage. All you have is your fingers but there is also a timbre parameter with sliders. This one is a wave multiplier, which adds additional harmonics to the waveform. Manipulating that timbre control with CV creates a very distinctive Buchla-esque sound. In addition, the polarity switch reverses the direction that a control voltage affects the pitch. So, if you switch it to negative and then route the sequencer to the pitch, it will play lower notes than the reference pitch, rather than higher notes. The keyboard switch hardwires the keyboard to control the pitch without needing to patch it. 
you can really start making sounds just using the complex oscillator. People talk a lot about East Coast versus West Coast synthesis styles, but those terms are really oversimplifications. But the quintessential difference comes in additive versus subtractive synthesis approaches. In a Moog synthesizer, we start with a harmonically rich oscillator, such as a sawtooth or a square wave. Then, we shape the timbre by running it through filters that take away some of the harmonic content. Different types of filters take away different parts of the sound spectrum, hence the term subtractive synthesis. Buchla approaches it from the opposite direction. You start with a sine wave, which has no harmonic content beyond the fundamental frequency of the oscillator. The complexity of the waveform is further expanded through frequency or amplitude modulation by the modulation oscillator. Or through ring modulation with the external sound source coming through the preamp. There might be a tendency to think of an oscillator that modulates another oscillator as somehow secondary, but this is not really the case. Routing the modulation oscillator through gate 2 makes it audible. It responds to the keyboard and any other control voltage inputs to control pitch. So, you can really think of the easel as a two-voice synthesizer, with a few limitations. The voices are not synchronized with each other. So, for example, you could not play a two-note chord on the keyboard and hear one oscillator play each note. But, you most certainly could use the mod oscillator to play a looping bass line with the notes triggered from the sequencer while driving the pitch of the complex oscillator from the keyboard and arpeggiator. Another common use would be to have the mod oscillator playing a bass drone while controlling the complex oscillator with the sequencer or keyboard. But that's only half the story. The reason that the modulation oscillator is so named is because it is hardwired to modulate the audio of the complex oscillator, creating the interesting timbral changes that are such a part of this instrument. The modulation oscillator has the same pitch sliders as the complex oscillator, but with the difference that there is a switch to choose between frequency ranges. Set to high, the slider goes between 55 and 1760 hertz, just like the complex oscillator. But setting it to low turns the mod oscillator into an LFO, with a range of 17 hertz to 55 hertz. At the low end of that spectrum, you can generate very slow LFOs, which are perfect for drones and changing timbre over a long period of time. The mod oscillator has a waveform switch to select triangle, pulse, or sawtooth waveforms, just like the complex oscillator. But unlike the complex oscillator, it doesn't have a timbre knob. There is no blending of the signal with a sine wave. It has a keyboard switch, which allows you to hardwire the keyboard voltage to pitch like the complex oscillator. Thus, turning off the keyboard switch on the modulation oscillator allows you to use it as a drone while using the keyboard to generate pitches with the complex oscillator. Which brings us to the primary function of the modulation oscillator. There are two levels to control modulation amount, a manual one and a control voltage amount version, just to its left. This value controls how much this oscillator is modulating the complex oscillator. This modulation is hardwired into the easel, but what type of modulation are we talking about? Well, there are two types, which are selected by the modulation switch. There is frequency modulation, where it is modulating the pitch of the complex oscillator.
and amplitude modulation, where it is modulating the amplitude. These two sounds are quite different, but both incredibly cool. There is a third modulation type, ring modulation, which sounds similar to amplitude modulation, but is not the same. Unfortunately, you can't use ring mod directly between the modulation and complex oscillators. Instead, the easel routes the external input to the complex oscillator for ring modulation. Before we keep moving leftward on the instrument, let's take a quick look at the inverter module. This handy dandy little function inverts the value of the control voltage being sent into it. So a signal that would normally cause a pitch to go up, would cause it to go down instead. There is a buffered op amp between the input and the output, so you could send a signal both to the inverter and another input, and the inverted signal would not disturb the original copy. For example, you could play a melody on the sequencer that gets sent to both oscillators, then invert one of them, and have instant counterpoint. Note that the from card and to card jacks have to do with sending signals to the programming card that you can plug into the card jack. But that's a topic for another day. The pulser is a ramp and trigger generator that sends out short pulses at regular intervals. The way that it works is a bit... Buchla-esque, so bear with me. The pulser receives a trigger input, then generates a descending ramp voltage. That ramp voltage is present at the yellow banana jack. When the ramp voltage reaches zero volts, the pulser then generates its output trigger. So, we need to figure out what generates the input trigger, how long the ramp lasts for, and where the output trigger is routed to. Let's start with the ramp length. This is what the pulser sliders control. As with the rest of these primary voltage sources, there is a manual slider and a CV control slider to its left. They control the period of the pulser, which, as mentioned, is defined by the length of the ramp. There is quite a range to that period, from 2 milliseconds to 10 seconds. Now, let's talk about the input trigger, which is needed to start the whole process. The mode switch, right above the period controls, determines whether the pulser is receiving input triggers, and thus creating output triggers. In the off position, the pulser isn't listening to any trigger sources. If you push down the lever to the once position, you'll find that it's spring-loaded and will generate a single input trigger before going back to the off position. This is great for using the pulser to manually start processes that are looking for a trigger. But if you want the pulser to trigger periodically, or trigger as a result of other inputs besides that spring-loaded once switch, then you need to set the mode to triggered. Now, the pulser will start its cycle when triggers are sent to it. So where can those triggers come from? That is determined by the trigger select switch, which is right above the mode switch. When trigger select is set to keyboard, then every new tap on the keyboard causes the pulser to be triggered. Remember that there is that ramp wave delay between the pulser receiving its input trigger and the output trigger it sends out. The next trigger select position is self, which means that the pulser's own trigger output gets sent into itself as the trigger input. This will result in a regular stream of pulses that occur at the period value of the pulser. Note that this circular chain of pulses actually needs to get started with an initial trigger pulse. So, you can do that by momentarily pushing the mode switch to once to generate that initial trigger, then flipping it to triggered so that it can react to that trigger and start the chain of triggers. If this all sounds a bit perplexing, it is. But watch this section of the video a few times. Or, better yet, if you have an easel, go play with this function. It'll start to make sense. The last pulser input trigger source is the sequencer. We will get to the sequencer in a minute, but the thing to know is that every time the sequencer moves forward a step, a trigger is generated. Unless the pulse sequence switch for that step is in the down or off position. 
This is no different than how a trigger sequencer works in Eurorack or in a step-based drum machine. So that's a lot to take in. Let's go over it one more time before moving on. The pulser takes in an input trigger, then generates a descending ramp voltage that is present at the yellow output jacks. The time it takes for that ramp voltage to reach zero is the period of the trigger, and can be between 2 milliseconds and 10 seconds. That period is what is controlled by the manual and CV input sliders for the pulser section. When the ramp voltage reaches zero, the pulser generates its output trigger. Remember, the pulser needs an input trigger to work. When the mode switch is pushed to once, it generates a single input trigger that starts the process. When it is set to off, the pulser is not functioning. And when it is set to triggered, the pulser is set to receive input triggers from one of its three trigger sources. Those sources are, every time you tap a note on the keyboard, steps from the sequencer that have their trigger switch in the on position, and from the pulser itself. If the pulser is self-generating its triggers, then you need to kickstart the process by pushing down on the mode select to once, then setting it to triggered. <sighs> that pulser was a pretty big module. Now let's look at an easy one, the random voltage generator. This module generates random voltages that appear at the white output jacks. There are four white output jacks, and each one gets their own random voltage. They are not the same as each other. Those voltages get continually output until the voltage generator gets a new trigger input, which then sends new random voltages to each of the white output jacks. Those triggers can come from the keyboard, meaning a new set of random voltages appear every time you play a new key. Or they can come from the pulser. Every time the pulser sends its output trigger, the random voltages can change. Or it can come from the sequencer. Every time the sequencer moves forward a step, if the pulse sequence switch for that step is set to on, then it will trigger a new set of random voltages. The Buchla easel has a single ASD, or attack sustained decay envelope. There are separate manual sliders for each stage of the envelope, but there are no built-in CV controls to change the envelope values. Fortunately, the easel toolbox from Portable Labs gives control voltage access to the envelope stage values. One thing to get used to on the easel is that the shortest attack, sustain, and decay values are when the sliders are at their topmost values. Each stage gets longer and longer the farther down you move the slider. Just like the pulser's period length, the length of each envelope stage is between 2 milliseconds and 10 seconds. This gives you enough range to use the envelope for short, percussive sounds, as well as very long ambient drones. So how does the envelope generator work? Well, like the pulser, it has a mode switch and a trigger select switch. The mode switch can be set to transient, where each of the envelope stages work for the amount of time you specified with the attack, sustain, and decay sliders. Finally, there is sustain mode. In this mode, when the envelope generator receives a trigger, such as a note on the keyboard being played, it will output the attack stage, then will stay on the sustain stage as long as it is still receiving that trigger. Then, when the trigger stops, it moves on to the decay stage. So, it makes perfect sense to use this mode when playing the keyboard. The envelope will continue to sustain as long as the key is held down. Finally, let's look at the input trigger choices. When the switch is set to keyboard, you trigger a new envelope every time you play a note on the keyboard. When the switch is set to pulser, then a new envelope is generated every time the pulser generates its output trigger. And when it is set to sequencer, then a new envelope is generated every time the sequencer moves to a new stage where the pulse sequence switch is in the on or up position. So as you can see, these trigger input choices are exactly the same on the envelope generator as they are on the pulser, keyboard, pulser, or sequencer. The sequential voltage source is a combination trigger and voltage sequencer. It has five stages, each of which has a voltage setting and a trigger setting. The voltage sliders would typically be used for pitch to generate melodies, but of course they can be used to modulate any parameter on the easel. Above each of the voltage sliders is a corresponding trigger switch, as we have already talked about a couple of times.
In the down position, it is off and does not generate a trigger output when the sequencer moves to its stage. When it is up, the blue LED for that stage gets lit and the trigger is output to drive the pulser or envelope generator. This allows you to generate melodic snippets by setting the voltage levels for each stage, but creating more complex rhythms by only turning some of the pulse sequence switches on. Like the pulser in the envelope generator, the sequencer needs a trigger to work. In this case, each trigger moves the sequencer forward one step. And of course, when you're on the last step of the sequence, the next trigger loops it around to the beginning again. The trigger sources for the sequencer are the keyboard and the pulser. If you think about it, you can set the sequencer to be triggered by the pulser, while the pulser is triggered by the sequencer. This circular trigger routing seems to work exactly the same way as if the pulser was self-triggered. Don Buchla always marched to the beat of his own drummer, so of course the easel has a five-stage sequencer. I personally think this is fantastic, as it takes you away from the typical 8 or 16 step sequencer. The stages switch also allows you to set the sequence to 3 or 4 steps instead, but 5 is so cool. Now let's take a look at the lower half of the easel, which is a human voltage interface in the shape of a keyboard. I refer to it that way because you could just as easily use a non-keyboard shaped input device to send voltages to the synthesizer section. In fact, the Buchla Easel Model K does exactly that, substituting the 223E multi-dimensional kinesthetic input tactile input port for the 218E. But I have the more common keyboard model, and the point is that you can use it just as easily to control other sound parameters as you can pitches. Let's take a look. The keyboard covers two octaves and a major third, from C to E. It is a capacitive touch plate design with no moving parts. The pressure parameter is not from pressing down harder, but from the amount of your skin area that is making contact with the key. On the far left above the keyboard are the three keyboard signal outputs. Pulse, which sends a trigger every time a key is pressed, pressure, which is the capacitive sensing, and main, which is the pitch of the key being pressed, plus any additional voltage from the preset voltage source or the portamento, which we'll look at shortly. Each of the keyboard outputs have little LEDs next to them that light when the output is sending signal. The synthesizer's keyboard connections are located right above the keyboard outputs, so for their default state, you just run three short banana cables from output to input. But, as with everything else on the easel, this is optional. You can actually route the keyboard output signals to any input. Next up is the portamento knob. This determines the glide time in between notes, if any. You use it to create long, smooth glissandi across the keyboard. Interestingly enough, the portamento function also has a CV input, so you could route any CV output on the easel to control the portamento time. The easel's arpeggiator is a wonderful addition to the instrument that was not part of the original. It's very simple, but can really animate the use of the keyboard. It has a rate knob to control the speed of the arpeggiation and a CV input to control it as well. Then there is a three-way mode switch to select the behavior of the arpeggiator. Ascending, random, and none. Ascending mode gives you an arpeggio that plays from lowest to highest note played, then starts at the bottom again. Random chooses from all the notes you have held down. Be aware of the fact that it can choose the same note more than once in a row. And then none turns off the arpeggiator. When you're not using the arpeggiator, you should remember to set the mode switch to none. Otherwise, if you are pressing a key, there will be a delay at the beginning of the next step before the pitch is sent out. This can be very confusing. It seems as if the keyboard isn't working. So, if you are pressing a key and not getting the results you're expecting, 
be sure to check that the arpeggiator mode is set to none. Last up are the four preset voltage sources. These consist of four preset buttons and their corresponding knobs above them. These come in very handy for expanding the range of the keyboard and for having another set of voltages that you can use for whatever other parameter you want. In the octave mode, the four preset buttons act as transposition for the keyboard, so you can quickly select between different ranges. In the preset mode, the knobs come into play. Whatever value you have the selected knob at is added to the pitch coming from the keyboard and is also available at the output jack just to the left. You can move the voltage knobs live, of course, which brings another set of user controls into play. There is a blue LED next to the module that lights to show the relative value of the currently selected preset voltage knob. So other than the program card, that is a comprehensive look at the Buchla Music Easel, module by module. Of course, in this case, the whole is very much more than the sum of the parts, but I hope that this detailed breakdown helps you in your understanding of this amazing instrument and its capabilities. Don Buchla's designs were so different from everything else. His synthesizers really stand in a class all their own. My thanks to Don, and also to Todd Barton, whose online videos about the easel really inspired me to delve into this fascinating instrument. So that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. Join the conversation by adding your thoughts in the comments section below. And, as always, if you like what we are doing here on Under the Big Tree, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. For now, this is Nick, signing off. <laughs>